Hello, Serge here from the back porch. Today we're going to, we're going to do partly a lesson, but mostly a history lesson. And and I'm going to read you an article from on Golf Week magazine. Uh, I I read Golf Week because it's very informative. It tells us more about what's going on in the world of golf, not so much in golf instruction. And and it keeps me up to date on what what again is happening in the lives of a lot of players. And it's very interesting reading if you want to if you want to run into stories like that. And they have some great. Uh, writers who, who do some very good human interest stories and I recently did one about a, an 80 year old golfer who shot 67 breaking his age by 13 strokes and I have another one now and it's titled History Lessons from Those Who Lived It by Beth Ann Baldry and I'm going to read a good part of this it's uh, basically one page and, and the reason why is because it is a history lesson but it's a history lesson about the LPGA and I, and I think it would be good for all of us to, to know and, and, and I got some comments on it uh, as I normally always do. And again, the, it starts out and it's from Phoenix. It says, on her flight to the desert, Louise Sugg settled into the first row of economy class. Not long after takeoff, the flight attendant came to Suggs 87 and thanked her for her role in women's golf. The attendant, a self-proclaimed golf nut, offered to treat Suggs to a cocktail from first class. Go for it, Suggs replied. And so began her journey to the R.R. R. Donnelly LPGA Founders Cup, Commissioner Mike Wan's vision of celebrating the past and building for the future. Of the five survivors from the 13 LPGA founders, three were here. Marilyn Smith, Shirley Spork, and, and Suggs. Sitting down with the top trio opens a fascinating door to the past where legends, legends such as Babe Saharius and Bob Jones come to life. Any woman who makes her living in the golf industry owes a tremendous debt of gratitude for all these women's accomplishments. Their personalities, each infectious in different ways, makes it easy to see why they found success. Kudos to Juan for creating an opportunity for players and fans to show appreciation and soak up history. Spork, 83 years old, walked to the first tee Thursday morning, gave a thumbs up, sign and sent her a tee shot sailing into the sailing in the amount of time it takes most current LPGA stars to draw a breath. Artificial hips and knees did nothing to slow Spork who played the 18 hole pro-am alongside Juan. Last year Spork matched her age on her birthday with a birdie on the last hole. Congratulations. One of the game's great teachers Spork collected used golf balls as a kid sold them to the pro shop and bought her first club of putter for a dollar. Thus began a love affair in 1951, took her to the United Kingdom for a month-long series of clinics at the invitation of Dick Penfold. I imagine he might be the guy who built the Penfold golf balls because there was a golf ball called Penfolds. I was the very first lady professional ever invited into the Royal and Ancient Clubhouse, Spork said. In a clubhouse boardroom, members were admiring Sport's ability to get her wedge shots airborne around the green. They asked for a demonstration. There wasn't room, so they said, get up on the table, she said. And so Spork, in one of the most memorable golf lessons, stood on top of a table in the RNA clubhouse and showed an alternative to the classic bump and run. I'll always remember that experience, she said. What happened next in this interview shows what's so special about having these women in the same room. Spork finished talking about St. Andrews, turned to Suggs, and asked her to share what Spork considers an important story about her relationship with Bobby Jones. Suggs and Jones played quite a bit of golf together at Eastlake Golf Club in Atlanta and there was one round in particular when Suggs hooked her drive behind a big oak tree that stands out. Quote, Mr. Jones, how would you play this? Suggs asked. Jones told the 19 year old that she could play it any way she wanted. Under, over, or around either side. He dropped four balls next to mine and did just that, hitting all four in the green, Suggs said. She was too stunned to respond. Well, the point I want to make here about what just happened is uh, to Louise Suggs in that incident was that she was playing with a extremely good player, as we all know who Bobby Jones is, considered one of the greatest amateurs, if not the greatest amateur ever lived. And and he won the he won the, the four majors, British Open, British Amateur, and uh, U.S. Open and U.S. Amateur, and as well as a number of other majors, and he could do it all. And Suggs got to be able to play with him a lot at Eastlake. One of the best ways for you to get better is to stop playing with better players. Keep that in mind. Uh, 
All you have to do is ask. Many times, higher handicappers are intimidated to play, to even ask. But you, it'll never happen if you don't ask. And and as I said, that's the best way to get better. And, and in many cases, one of the one of I've always said the other side of the coin is if you keep playing with players much less than your ability, it's going to basically have a chance like dragging an anchor. It's going to be holding you back. So it's great to play with them, but since you since but if you want to get better, you have to sometimes move up. And and the only way to do that is to play with better players and go ahead and ask them. And you might be surprised because every good player at one time was a beginner and all the stages into getting to be real good. And, and if they're honest and they're decent people, they remember what it was like. So don't ever hesitate to, to go and ask a better player if you can join up with them. And the other thing about when you're playing is, is especially if it's just a nice social game, it's not in a tournament or whatever, don't be scared to ask them some questions. Uh, many times what I would say is, is when you see them having a shot, whether it be in the rough or, or behind a tree, just like, just like uh, Louis Suggs did with Bobby Jones, Ask them, what are they thinking about? How would they play? What club would they use? What shot would they use? And, and maybe even ask them to go ahead and demonstrate it if you're not going to be holding up play, if the courses are real busy. That's how you learn how to play golf. I mean, we all, don't, we all don't just take up the game and have all the answers. The answers come from experience, having done it all, and been there and done that, as the expression goes. So don't be scared to ask the, for their advice. First off, ask them to play, and then get out there and ask them for their advice. And many, many of them. And if you fail on the first question, the first try with a good player, keep trying. Because I guarantee you, there's plenty of them out there that, that they just love to be able to share their knowledge and experiences and help somebody who's willing to ask and, and is interested and wants to learn. That's the whole thing. Again, most golfers, and even professionals like me, it's, I, I just don't walk up to people and tell them, hey, I think you ought to be doing this, or I'm so-and-so, and, -so, and I, 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 why don't you try this? No, the key is, is don't be scared to ask, and, and that's the key. Ask to play, and then ask them about some of the things they're doing. When they hit that shot, as I said, figure out what you do, and if they do something different, ask them why and how to do it. And you'd be surprised what, how many of them will tell you and how much better you're going to get. Well, going on with this article, this is what brought up another thought that of what I really want to say. Beth Ann Baldry, the writer of this article, goes on to say, these three could talk for days about what went into building the LPGA and the fun they had in the process. When Smith talks about tremendous drive, she's not referring to a 240-yard poke with, with a persimmon head. She's talking about a 1,600-mile journey from one tour stop to the next in a green Dodge. They reminisced about their tight-knit community when the entire field stayed in the same motel. And it goes on to say a few other things. Now, the last paragraph, I think, is especially momentous in this in this, and, it, and it's going to lead me to my final comment about, about this story and, and, and history. Quote, I think it's hard when players, grandparents, probably aren't as old as our founders, said Kari, Kari Webb, who won the tournament. But you know, just to sit down and talk to them and to listen to some of their stories, you can't believe what they did. Cheers to that. And again, we can't believe. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that's being made in this, in this day and age of, of 2011 with little video cameras the one I'm presently talking to you all is is the size of a cell phone and with with cameras that small and, and the technology we have where you can Skype somebody and, and interview them with a Skype and videotape it is is that we have so many great golfers still alive who won't be with us forever who have such unbelievable stories in the in the PGA of America we have our club pros who were the founding fathers or our Probably many of them not out around, but they've been in it going back 50 and 60 years that they have experiences, and many of them have played with the former great touring pros like, like Ben Hogan and Byron Nelson, and they have stories to tell. And, and then we have the players themselves, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicklaus, and, and Lee Trevino, and Gary Player, and, and Ad Infinitum, Gene Littler, and it goes on, Billy Casper, who just celebrated a birthday. I heard on TV the other day, somebody said that he had just turned, I believe it was 80. And... and we need to get these guys stories and then we deal PGA like we just talked about and, 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 and great amateurs who played amateur golf the stories about the personalities and the, and the things they went through 40 and 50 years ago that none of us can even fathom the golf channel did a great expose on on black golfers the history of black golfers and the things they went through when they couldn't play when they couldn't play on a PGA tour I mean those things have to be captured for, for, for history we have the, the the World Golf Hall of Fame we have we have Museums, the USGA museum and, and the PGA has a museum. We, these are what that's for. Let's get the get these get these 
great players and, and their, their, their lives and times and their, their stories and, and everything else captured for posterity because just like us, they're not going to be here forever. We got a lot of them that are really, really getting on in age and we need to do this now. So I'm making a cry out to all of you and when you talk to, when you talk to anybody in the USGA or, or people in the PGA and I'm bringing this up at our, in the PGA and the PGA Tour, we need to capture this stuff so that we can all realize where the past was in golf, how we got to now and what we have to do in the future. All right, well, that's it for the search for today with this public service announcement as well as the two little tips about you want to get better, play with better players. And let's start capturing some history about the game of golf that we all love, love so much so we, can, so we know about it, we can pass it on to our heirs, and it's there forever and ever. Well, that's it for today, and I'll be talking to you all again soon.